Oof. Burr. Well, good morning, guys. It's pretty early. Sun's still not up yet. Alyssa's asleep. But I have a really unique opportunity to jump in on a flight today, and I'm gonna try to take you guys along with me because if it turns out to be a beautiful day, we're gonna see some amazing scenery. Poor little airplane. All alone out there looks so chilly, doesn't it? <laughs> Poor little guy doesn't doesn't have a hanger. Oh. So I'm gonna wait for a little while and a couple of pilots are on their way. The mission today is to rescue an airplane from East Central Montana. Temperature two Celsius, 2.1 Celsius. All right, radio's working, taxi lights, landing lights, beacon lights, final's clear. Good to go. RPMs are good, oil pressure's in the green, airspeed's alive. Alright, flight plan's activated. Someone important once noted the only things guaranteed in life are death and taxes. Yet most of us go through life expecting assurances and guarantees. Where risk exists, we sell that to an insurance company. As pilots, we don't like risk. We like knowing. We like control. Going without knowing can end very badly. The problem is we can't learn and we can't grow without risk. Being a pilot is all about managing risk. As a low hour pilot, it's very hard to gain rich experiences that usually only come from years spent in the air and having things not going according to our plan. So you either do the time and learn the hard way, or when the opportunity arises to get seat time with an experienced pilot, you drop everything and go. Just get out of this little cloud here. It's not too bad, but <clears throat> Don't really want to stay up in it. Today, we're off to recover a plane from far away. The plane can make it home, but the problem is the weather hasn't been great lately. But the plane has to come home now, so we're off to go get it. This opportunity came to me because I've been a pest at the local airport, looking for opportunities to jump in wherever and whenever I can. Wind 080 at 09er. Visibility one zero. After I went on one of these flights, I learned a really powerful lesson. You can't pay for this kind of experience. And since then, I've been hooked. Anytime there's an experienced pilot doing some sort of interesting mission, I can't wait, even if I just get to sit in the right seat. Hey, am I lined up with the center line? Uh, you gotta come a little left more. Nice work, guys. Yeah. I made it. There it is. The plane to be rescued. So the reason this flight's so exciting for me is I haven't really flown in a truly fast propeller airplane, high performance, low wing. And I'm excited to get this experience because we've talked about renting this plane and doing some flight training for complex and stuff. So.
Taxiing from the Skyline Aviation to uh, runway 08. They should rename that the Prop Eater. Nom nom, nom 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 nom. Props for breakfast. Airspeed's alive, oil pressure's in the green. Oil temperature's good. Plane likes to fly. Today was a perfect example of things not going according to plan. We did know the weather was deteriorating locally and it was expected, but we took a little longer than we probably should have and we found ourselves in weather that would make even the most experienced pilot shudder. The good news is we had two experienced pilots working together as a powerful team and we were able to mitigate and manage the risk well. So the plan heading home was to climb up to 12,000 feet clear the mountains, find some blue sky, and be home in no time. After all, we're flying a really fast airplane. Unfortunately, when we got close to the mountains, we started picking up ice, and we had to cancel our IFR clearance and go VFR. That means visual flight rules, look out the window. The thing is, there was an experienced CFI aboard, and he was able to manage the airplane while I managed navigation. We used a software called ForeFlight, which is fantastic because it's like a moving map GPS. And we were able to compare what we saw out the windshield with what I was seeing on our charts. And together, we were able to work as a team. It made sense to keep going. But we both agreed if at any time we felt uncomfortable, we would stop. In fact, we picked a route that had lots of airports along the way. So if things got too bad, we'd put it on the ground and wait it out. The thing is, when you jump in on one of these types of flights, there's no guarantee it won't be a blue sky tailwind flight with hardly anything gained. But if it's not, like today's return flight wasn't, you'll learn more than you could ever get from a book or flight lessons. Flying with an experienced pilot in deteriorating weather in a mountainous area in a fast airplane stretched my mind in a way I can't even describe. At the same time, it forced us both to get back to basics, look out the window, communicate, work as a team, trust our charts, and be disciplined. The ultimate reward for managing the risk well was getting home safely. Hey, how are you? Good, just landed. Bit of a journey. <laughs> I'll, I'll tell you about it when I, got, when I get home. Okay, I'll be home soon. Thanks. Bye. That's it guys, we made it home. That was an adventure, holy smokes. Did not sign up for that. So the other pilot that was with us, he ended up getting grounded. The weather got him. He was flying a much slower airplane and he made a decision to just hang it up. So he landed almost probably within half an hour after taking off. I'm glad we made the decisions that we had, but in all fairness, we had two pilots aboard. We were able to make a lot better decisions and we had a lot more resources. And by better decisions, I don't mean he made a bad decision. I mean, we had a lot more resources available. He's safe, but he's on the ground, so now he's waiting for a ride home. So it sounds like somebody may have to go rescue another airplane. Well, hopefully you guys enjoyed coming along. I'm starving. I'm gonna knock out some water, head home, and see what Alyssa's up to. Oh boy, what are you working on? We have low temperatures in the forecast. Yeah. Like freezing. So I'm slowly working on getting the garden wrapped up and preserving everything. And on my to-do list has been preserve the kale. But it's a project because a lot of them have aphids. Some of the ones that are really covered, like just immediately bleh, like lose my appetite. Yeah. So those are going in the compost. <laughs> okay. but anything that's not too bad, I'm just literally inspecting every single leaf yeah. You know, all the little curls in the leaf, front and back, and I'm getting off aphids and slugs. So, <laughs> wow. all of this right here Holy cow. is good, clean kale. So, I'm going to destem it, I'm going to blanch it, and then I'm going to freeze it. It looks like I'm seeing some black and stuff. I think we're you getting know, some frost. I think, I think it finally happened. I don't yeah. think we've showed the spaghetti squash yet on camera. No, look at this. Oh my oh god. My. We measured it. <laughs> Last time we measured it, it was two feet around. Two foot girth. Yeah. This is heavy. That squash <gasps> started clear over there in the bed and over the summer it found its way down out of the bed and it walked nearly all the way over here to the potatoes. Oh sweet, you finally got some dirt added to these things. I know we've been gonna do that forever. It's been on the to-do list, but we just haven't stopped for two seconds. So maybe that'll protect those potatoes and I don't know, maybe we'll get a few more out of there for sure. I don't know. Okay, I'm off to build stairs so that we can stop being ladder monkeys. Okie doke, I'll check in in a bit. Okay, do you want me to close this or do you good? Leave it open. Okay. In my sleep, 
I realized a few things that I did wrong already with this platform. One, it dawned on me that I forgot to put nosing on this plywood because this is a step. I can't remember what the rise is. I think it's seven and a half inches or something like that, but I need to have a nose. The Inter International Residential Building Code says three quarters of an inch is the minimum nosing. My plan with these treads is to make them a 10, 10 inch tread, but use a two by 12 for the actual tread, which will come out at 11 and a quarter inches. So that'll give me an inch and a quarter of nosing. I don't know if that's great or not. Um, it seems easier than trying to mismatch or cut down or rip down a bunch of lumber. I can deal with that later. And I'm, and I'm gonna kind of shelf that for now because I'd really like to work on getting the stringers built and kind of work through this set of stairs to, to kind of validate this stuff before I get too married to it. Uh, the other thing I realized is that this railing right here, I wanted to attach it with screws because I wanna be able to take that railing off if we wanna move furniture or whatever up through here. There actually is enough room to get appliances, although I don't think that's how we'll get them in the house, but never say never, right? So this railing, I nailed it on, I was getting tired, and I wanted to kind of pin this whole thing together. So there's that. Number three, I forgot to leave room for sheetrock back here. Um, I plan on bringing sheetrock down to the platform and then just using trim or something around there or, or nothing like most people do. Uh, but up here on the railing, I need to leave a minimum of probably five eighths of an inch because there's gonna be half inch sheetrock that'll go against the ICFs. So I'm not gonna worry about the railing right now. Like I said, I'm really wanting to get through the risers or the stringers and validate these stairs before I get completely married to this platform and really start to spit shine it. Because this set of stringers is going against the concrete, I bought pressure treat to build those stringers out of. And my plan was to build a rail here and basically continue that handrail right on down. So we're actually gonna use four stringers, one on the outside of that post, one on the inside, and then it'll be a total of three stringers across down here. So using our diagram here, this is going to have a total of five stairs and four treads. And it looks like the stringer is actually gonna be about 49 and three quarters of an inch long. And our tread is 10 inches deep and the riser is seven and three quarters inches. I think the safe thing to do is to just make one riser and if it looks good, everything's fitting good, we'll create two risers and then maybe set a level on them and kind of check them and do all that stuff. That way, if we make a mistake, we don't burn up a bunch of this expensive material. I checked my measurements and I made a mistake down here. I was trying to reference off of this line, which I did a really good job of, but I was using the inside of my combination square. So in the end, those risers are incorrect. Measure twice, cut once, right? So everything's looking really good. If I get six and a quarter here, add my inch and a half tread, we're at seven and three quarters to the first step. 
And then it's a little deceptive because we're using three quarter inch plywood here. So I've actually set the height of the platform to use three quarter plywood, not an inch and a half material here. Um, just so we don't have to run inch and a half stuff all across this you see a piece of three quarter. So we've got enough height here between the next tread and the platform and we're dialed at seven and three quarters. I think this is gonna work out good. So do a little bit of work and I think we can get all these uh, stringers put together and then it looks to me like maybe I didn't I didn't calculate this well I wouldn't say it's bad but I wouldn't say it's good either and that's the um, support for where the stringer attaches to the platform in my mind this is gonna be higher and I'm not sure like the other night I should have just quit working what we'll probably do is cut the we'll cut this stringer back like th three quarters of an inch and we'll probably use a piece of three-quarter plywood or something here and drop it down just to give us a nice attachment point for the top of that stringer. And then down the road a little ways, we're gonna have to put a kickboard in here that'll support this. So we'll have to notch out these stringers and then put a kickboard on the bottom so that the stairs have some sort of a cleat or something to kind of push against. I think it's really tempting to use kind of that stringer as a template and just trace it out on the next piece, right? But I kind of learned a lesson when we built our battery box and we used one of the rafters that we built with the bird's mouth and all that as a template. And the profound lesson I learned there was about reference errors and it's compounding. So we made a big boo-boo on that one. We used each successive rafter as a template. So we got farther and farther and farther and farther off. Big boo-boo. On this one, I think I'm just gonna use the, the math and do it with my square. It's predictable, it'll take a little bit longer, but I think in the end, I'll be happy I did. Alyssa just brought out dinner and I was able to enjoy it with her in the garage. Thank you for dinner. You're welcome. It was like a sausage, kind of like a sausage, sausage chard. Had some chard in it. Yeah. Yummy. Thank you so much. All right, I'm at kind of a, sort of kind of a stopping point, but I'm gonna move forward. I don't have a treated two by four to use as the kickboard down here on the concrete, but I'm just gonna use a temporary one and then I'll just, I'll just leave it loose and they can pull it out, stick a treated one in there, we'll glue it down and anchor it to the concrete. You guys probably remember our super scientific method of figuring out where the radiant is in the slab. We basically have this drone photo that just shows us the 12 by 12 inch grid that we use for the rebar. And we can use that to measure basically off of the foam back here and figure out roughly where the radiant probably is not. That's why we ended up putting this treated piece underneath this post, if you recall, we did not use the post base that we originally bought for that post because we could not be sure that right underneath that post, there was no radiant. We're gonna have the same problem right here with the tow board. So we gotta kind of make our best guess, but that's not for today. Hopefully we can just get this finished up and that'll be a good night. Before we continue, I wanna say thank you to our friends who brought us this summer peach cider. If you've been up to Canada at all, you know this stuff's like, soda pop at restaurants. It's a wonderful, refreshing after dinner kind of dessert beverage. If you're wondering, yes, it does taste just like peaches.
uh, need to hold pressure here. Okay. It's not shooting through very good. All right, that'll do for a temporary kickboard. Uh, we can get this last stringer installed and then we can put treads on and it'll be pretty much where it needs to be for tonight. I'm tempted to add kind of a, a scab or something on here and then toenail these in this direction just to give a little bit more bearing to these stringers. Not really sure how much weight the top of those stringers can bear. Someone says shaking cans is like T-Rex boxing. <laughs> I like it. T-Rex boxing, that's awesome. Well, something just dawned on me. I remember that I was gonna have an inch and a quarter of nosing, remember that? And I was worried that it would be too much. Yeah, we're at one and a quarter. Well, guess what? If we put a riser fascia, I don't even, was it called a tow board or something on here? Let's say we use half inch uh, plywood for that. Make a nice finished looking stair. That would bring the nosing to three quarters of an inch. So that actually works out pretty good. I'm not sure why I got lost on that in my head. I think what I was thinking is that the nosing would go on first and then the tread would go on and that would push this material out. So I guess in the end, this is working out pretty good. And that's why starting with a little staircase is great for me, just working through this stuff one step at a time. So before everybody gets excited, no, I did not forget to put down adhesive. We're not gonna do that at the moment. I really want to validate these steps. You can kind of tell that I'm doing a minimum viable product. They're definitely short steps. That's interesting. They don't feel shallow, so that's good. I haven't put the riser backs on yet though. Overall, I would say those are working out exactly the way we wanted them to. I was worried if you recall with the second set of plans that I had with the, I believe they were eight and three sixteenths risers, that the steps would be too steep. And seven and three quarters actually is, I can see it now, it's, it's pretty steep. It's not terrible, but there's definitely, you know, you're working to get up those stairs. Given that there's what, five steps here and 13 there, that's 18 steps to get into the house. This post is just temporary. It's just there for positioning. Um, that post is gonna be, I don't know, 30 something inches tall. And they'll end up being a railing that will connect the top of this post here up to this guy. And then we'll put our balusters on and we'll have 
a nice railing that we can hang on to. We're not gonna be putting on the railing on the other side because I think I might've shared this, but we're gonna build a wall at that post that's gonna go this way. And it's going to follow the angle of the stairs and the top of that wall will become the railing for the upper set of stairs. And the wall will just be a wall on the other side. There won't be a railing there. It's been good for me though to work on this small set because the big set is these guys. And these stringers, I can't remember how long they are, but in the end, that's $125 in lumber. It's gotta be right. The good news is it shouldn't be too difficult. In fact, it might even be a little bit easier because we can mount the kickboard directly to the joists and the plywood. But of course, we've gotta get that plywood fixed first because there's no nosing on it. So we've gotta do that before we can build the upper set of stairs. And I don't know, at some point, I'll probably take this railing back apart, but I don't think that's super urgent. I think it's more important that we get these stairs built and get them validated. I do wanna share that, as I mentioned, I think yesterday, this set of stairs has taken up a lot of room and it is feeling really cramped in here. Of course, we've got stuff stored over here and tools over there. And, and I'm hoping that if we can maybe move some of this stuff underneath the stairs and utilize that space, of course, once that ladder goes away, I think we can put maybe at least a couple of racks over there for right now. And that would kind of get us back under control. Of course, we're mid project on like five things right now. So we've got kind of supplies and materials coming out of our ears, but just I'll share this. It's something to think about. We went through this in both the homes that we designed. We designed one, we, we canned it because we didn't feel it was buildable. And the number one reason we started having questions about whether it was buildable or not was the stairs. We, we had this huge house and we couldn't find anywhere to put stairs. And it just, it didn't make any sense. The floor plan was plenty big enough. There should have been plenty of room for stairs and it just didn't make sense. And working with shelter, early on we actually built or we designed this into the floor so our clearance right here is actually seven feet two inches and when we put the 5 8 sheetrock that goes up here for fire code which we don't have but we're going to put it in there anyway because it makes sense uh we're seven feet two we'll come down to just over seven feet one there and then once you turn that corner of course that plywood's going to go away and once you turn that corner, you're never gonna be under six feet eight, which is the minimum IRBC head clearance, remember? So the good news is when we build the loft stairs, those loft stairs are gonna climb up there too. And this corridor right here is gonna be nice and generous. For us, it made a lot of sense to do over under stairs, conserve square footage. It's, it's the curse of having a multi-level home, but of course it's cheaper in the long run square footage because it's less roofing, less foundation, and all of those things. Hey, do you want to be half half excited about getting up to the living level? Why only half? Oh, because it's half done? <laughs> well, it's more like Did a third. Did you go up it yet? Uh, maybe like 10 times. Really? Can I go up it? Yeah. Oh my God, this is amazing. Wow. Look at that. I can't even imagine. Look how high up you are. You didn't even have to use your hands. I know, right? <laughs> This is so weird. I'm really happy with the direction. I feel like this is natural. I agree. I feel like going down there would not be natural. Yeah. You know, and we talked about the issue with the sewer, which I forgot because we have a clean out there. Long oh, story. We're not going to use it, but we were concerned that the stairs, because basically where that landing terminates is where those stairs would have terminated. Right. Going that way. So that, that plumbing would have been an issue too. Forgot about that. This is incredible. Yeah. Do you like it? I do. I, whatever, whatever, like rise and run, whatever yep. like is good. That's the minimum for code. Oh, they, and so I think it's good. I think it works. Great, good job. Yay. Are we hot tubbing tonight? I totally need to check it. I have a hunch the fire went out, so oh, it no. better be a temp. Spoiler. All right, well, if not tonight, then manana. Insurance, hot tub insurance. Yeah. All right, well, I think tomorrow I'm gonna work on the other set and there's a chance, a chance. Did it finish? That we're gonna go up to the house tomorrow, not through a ladder. That would be so cool. Uh,